you are listening to Off Planet Radio at offplanetradio.com. Welcome to All Planet TV. I'm Randy Moggins. And um, one of the topics that we discuss from time to time, well, it's actually more than one topic. It's many topics. It's science. It's health. It is uh, what we can do to heal ourselves, to heal our planet. We have the substance. It's called water. You might have heard of it. It's rather abundant on the planet. It is also the center of a great deal of controversy. Um, it is subject to all kinds of controls by governments battles from corporations. Um, we seem to have an, a distinct lack of the, the real thing, the clean stuff, the stuff that we can actually utilize and drink. And yet it is essential for our functioning. Our bodies are three quarter water. The planet itself is three quarters water. And we ourselves rely on this as one of the most basic elements in order to sustain our living organisms. Well, in this program today, I'm going to introduce you to two people who are working at the forefront of science and technology right now to bring out a new type of water. Um, people have talked about this. I will point out, by the way, also that uh, we have done shows before on this type of thing. Our friend, um, our late friend Jeff Harvey was here about a year and a half, two years ago to talk about what at that time was called EZ water. And we'll talk about what that is. What, what we're going to talk about today is the next level of water. It is the fourth phase water now being put out by our friends who we're about to meet. Steve and Kirsten Sedemeyer are the architects and engineers and scientists and marketers behind um, this new fourth phase water, which is called H302. And Steve and Kirsten, welcome to the show. Thank you, Randy, for hosting us. We, we're excited to be on your show and be able to talk about what we've found about with this water. I'm excited to have you on. I'm excited that, you know, we're able to update the information and also to bring out new information. Um, the H302 water is obviously the next level of development above the easy water and what has been called in the past structured water. There are op obviously a number of methods and modalities out there for um, processing water into different phases. And one of the things that we want to do is go into the science of this. Tell people where they can find you. Your website would probably be the most basic element of that. I'll let Kirsten answer that. She's my marketing guru here. Um, yeah, the, the website is a great resource. Um, you can actually find more information at www.diviniawater.com. And we have it spelled behind us as well, <laughs> so you can see. Um, but it's an excellent resource. We're always updating it with um, news and updates of what's going on here at the company, um, the technology we're pioneering, um, investor relations, uh, conferences we're visiting, um, but it's also um, very up-to-date as far as the science of the water as well, and um, current and, and past discoveries we've made on the water and the advancements um, within that realm. Now, many people have heard about um, what's called fourth phase water. Um, the science has been around for a while. Steve, give us a little bit of the background on how you got into this 
and the people that you've worked with and how you came to a place where you are now beginning to develop this technology, which has to do with, don't get scared of the terminology listeners, basically irradiating the water. So bring us up to speed on where you've been in this journey and how you got started and where we're going with this. I would love to. I'd love to tell this story. I can't tell it enough. My, my, what I call my wife was a water snob, that she drank water out of bottles, which really bothered me because we'd go to a restaurant and she'd buy a bottle of water for three, four dollars. Mm -hmm. And I go, why can't you just drink the water on the table? It's free. And she said, no, 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 it's much better water. So I said, oh, okay, fine. So I, I was a good husband and, and shut my mouth up. So we bought a water distiller for the house uh -huh. so I could start making water at home. <clears throat> it was a typical water distiller. Uh, the, very much like the heater of your water in your house. It has some a pair of electrodes that go into water here. And th these electrodes heat up. And as they heat up, they heat the water. And those electrodes are in contact with the water itself. So anything that's in the water will destroy those things. Well, this water distiller actually malfunction probably about 30 times within two to three years. It, it just kept burning out. Just mm -hmm. like you had to keep replacing your heating elements mm -hmm. in your hot water heater, that's what happens. And that's because of all the pollutants and, and all the minerals that are in the hot water heater. <clears throat> so I decided being a scientist and, and I, at the age of 16, worked for Martin Marietta in theoretical mathematics and space flight mechanics, mm -hmm. and um, also propulsion systems. I was the youngest manager at one of their, their divisions. And if I can show you, I also, uh, because of my science background, also invented basically the flat screen TV that everybody uses today. And I had the first high definition TV. And if I can show you a picture of that here, I will bring that up. Let's see. Oh, I don't want that one. I want this one. And you should be able to see a picture of a gorgeous younger guy. Mm -hmm. That was me many years ago. Um, standing next to what we call this fiber vision. And this fiber vision was a four foot by six foot prototype of that screen that hangs on your wall today and that's a million pixels back then they were only doing 40,000 pixels mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so I was the first one to ever to produce a, a million pixels we eventually got those screens up to 9 foot by 12 foot at 4 million pixels and we were putting them into stadiums and arenas and um, so my background was in in physics and mathematics and also in um, inventing this fiber optics screen and back when this article was written I actually pro projected um, that your TV set would hang on the wall it would be 55 inches it would be half an inch to an inch thick and weigh about 15 pounds and hang on the wall. Mm -hmm. And I received a lot of hate mail off of that. Because <laughs> people said it would never happen, they could never invent that, the physics couldn't support it, et cetera, et cetera. And here we are talking today on monitors that do that. And of course, if, you're, if you watch the Super Bowl today, yeah. he is part of my technology. Yeah, those screens have actually shown up in stadiums, concert halls. Um, I've actually been to several large concerts where those screens were the way that a lot of people saw the, the concert itself because of the size of the venue. You're talking, you know, 20, 30,000 people. It's, it's a yeah, yeah. technology. So when you see that, that's basically my technology. Um, Japan really took it over 
uh, and loved it. I tried to go around the United States here trying to get people to grasp the technology. Zenith, RCA, uh, all the large manufacturers here. And even yeah, after, notice, notice Zenith and RCA, how dominant they are in the TV industry today. I'm sitting yeah. here. Uh, I have throughout my house Samsung and Toshiba, so I don't think that's worked out real well for them. No, it hasn't. Uh, well, because they didn't want to invest in it, and they thought their technology was going to last forever. So being with this background, I thought I could make a water distiller for my wife that would distill the water, and we would stop by and bottle water from it. So I, I started off, and I looked around, and I decided upon a new type of technology where I would put water in a glass vessel and put it in a resonant chamber and have the waves uh, in the middle of that, introduced in the middle of that, so that it would heat the water up and distill the water. And I thought, it, I, because of the frequency that I was using, I thought maybe there'd be some change in it, but I didn't realize exactly what the major change was going to be. And so once we started distilling this water, we found some unusual properties to it that we could not understand. And I wanted to understand it as a physicist. Mm -hmm. So it started me on a long, long quest. Uh, it's been about 12 years. And it's taken me trying to understand this water, even to some of the medical uh, books that I've had to study and learn about physiology. I had to, oops, let's, let's try this way here. Uh, as you can see, I, I've read some of these nice thick books. I've read about a hundred of those and started getting into the medical reasons of what water was other than even the physics reasons. Because we started to understand the physics of the water, but we didn't understand why it was starting to help people's health. Mm -hmm. And we've been able to take a mixture of this water and mix it with gasoline and run about 80% water, 20% gas, and run an engine on it. We, yeah, if, if you go to YouTube and look up Microwave Guru uh, on it, you will see four videos that show us growing fish, growing plants, um, doing some cold fusion with it, and also um, burning it with some gas. So it was pretty interesting. Um, and one of the things that we were trying to understand, for instance, here's a bottle here that I have, and this is a mixture of water and oil our and water. with our water. Mm -hmm. And you can tell how nice it's mixed here, and you can see it's a homogeneous one. Now, we also... Now, what is that oil exactly that you have? Is it just standard petroleum? It's coconut oil. Mm -hmm. Just coconut oil because okay, okay. Coconut that's oil. Very interesting. That's very interesting. I use coconut oil. It tastes good. Dude. Yeah, I'll bet. It really tastes good. This okay. is tap water and the same amount of oil, and you you can see it's the normal thing where you hear water and oil don't mix. Mm -hmm. Well, any water you drink and oil does not mix, except. If you mix it with our water, it does mix. And stays mixed. And stays mixed. Yeah, mixed. yeah we're going to come back to that bottle towards the end of this video. Um, we're going to look at that again to make sure it didn't settle. Yeah, and and here's a couple of them that are very interesting. Yeah, hold that up just a little bit higher so we can see the bottom there. Uh, there we go. And there we go. Yeah often come back, well, how is your water different than distilled water? Um, and this shows fundamentally how different our water is compared to even something like distilled water or, or something that attempts to come close. Because um, even um, then, yeah. I, I don't know if you'd be able to tell, but there's bacteria growth inside of the bottle. Form. Yeah, let me see if I can get up close and you can see this. And you can see how rancid it is. You can see the bacteria right in here. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
this is what happens with why your oil goes rancid. Um, oh, yeah. It's because yeah. it's mixed with the water out of the atmosphere, and it goes bad. And I would this has a lot of bacteria in it that I would not want to drink. And that was distilled water. And this is tap water. And it just doesn't even begin to mix at all. You can let see me go it's back. Like, let me go back to the distilled water for a minute. Um, I've worked in laboratories, and distilled water is obviously used for certain processes. It's useful. But essentially, distilling water strips the mineral elements out of the water. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So even though, is it structurally changing the water as well in a normal distillation process? Or is this just... It does it's not. distillation to remove impurities from the water. Impurities from it. Yeah, and the impurities are, are a very important thing because water's basic usage is for chemical reactions. If you look at the Grand Canyon, it was a great way to wear down all that rock and carry it away. In your body, it actually does exactly the same thing. It hydrates you. But what that really means is that hydration actually carries impurities out of your cells. And it supplies the hydrogen and oxygen. And you need the oxygen, obviously, to live and hydrogen. Uh, for instance, that's how your body generates hydrogen peroxide. And it does it from the water that you actually drink. So water is very important to the body. but And I'll get into it in a little bit later. But... The right type of water is actually more important. You don't have the right type of water, you're actually damaging your body. You can actually hurt the whole process. Um, and I'll, I'll just briefly touch on that if I share a screen here with you. And what I'm looking at, this is a picture of the human body or a, a diagram of it. And it shows what all the acidic levels are in your body. <clears throat> and as you can start out, the pH level in your body, in your mouth, is 6.78 to 7.5. So it switches between alkaline and acidic. And then it travels down the esophagus, and when it hits your stomach, your stomach is about 1.5 to 2.5 pH which is actually stronger than the acid you have in your car battery. Mm -hmm. So your stomach is extremely acidic. And when you drink alkaline water, you neutralize that acidity and you start damaging your body right there. The minute you drink any alkaline water, it will start hurting your stomach. And what it does, it neutralizes it so that you cannot start the proper digestion process in your stomach. And I'll get back into that because I'd really like to touch on that. And you, you can see Let's see that. whole thing, how everything changes. And one of the reasons that your stomach is very acidic is that it needs to kill bacteria in your stomach. Because when you eat anything in your mouth and it travels down the esophagus, you carry bacteria with it. Maybe there was bacteria in the food, maybe you got bad bacteria uh, from utensils, whatever it is. And when it hits your stomach, your stomach is supposed to kill that. And it does it with the acid. If you have a neutral stomach, it doesn't do that. And that bacteria starts working its way into your cell, into the cells of the stomach and into your um, body itself. Mm -hmm. And it will actually start eroding the cells of your stomach so you get E. coli very easily. So that happens to be a, a major portion of it. So kind of going back to the story, I, I, I made this water, and it was behaving strangely. It, it, we could not store it in plastic. And we could not understand why we can't store it in plastic. Mm -hmm. because it's a very, what we call, aggressive water. But it, it makes people healthy. It, it's extremely healthy for people. It made fish grow. It made animals grow. It, everything, birds, we, we tried it on everything. And they just bloomed. So I start out on a quest. I'm trying to find out what 
this water was about. And one of the quests led me to a university, University of Pennsylvania, um, that was famous and is world famous for material sciences. And to a man by the name of Dr. Russell Roy, yes. who actually was kind of the forefather of material sciences in the United States. Very familiar with his work, by the way, yeah. Yeah, world famous. So he helped me start studying exactly what this water was. And one of the things we found out here, there was a study that was done by Martin Marietta, the Aerospace uh, Corporation, in the Department of Chemistry of Rensselaer Polytech. And the reason they wanted to start looking at this, let me make sure this is the one here. The reason they wanted to look at this is the measurement of the Raman spectrum of liquid water. And they wanted to be able to tell whether water was water on planets or not. Because obviously we can't go there and test the water, but they can look at the spectra of it, the emissions that the the photons are given off by the water and guess whether it was water or not because they think water might be in a different form on different planets there's a possibility that the water that we have here is not the same as the water on Jupiter or exactly. any other. yeah and that's because it's been bombarded by different rays and the different temperatures and different distances from the Sun so this study basically found, looked at a lot of different principles of it, and they looked at the bonding between the hydrogen and oxygen. And what they found out that the bonding of the hydrogen and oxygen, typically here on Earth, made a curve like what I'm following with the mouse here. And this particular thing, they have found out in a lot of other different companies now and universities follow that path for the water here on earth mm -hmm. and and what you see is that if you take all these small curves here like these that i'm tracing and add those together it makes the big curve it's called deconvoluting it so the big curve is made up of smaller curves and these smaller curves have actually represent the different bonds in oxygen and hydrogen. The bond being the stretch, which means the distance between the electrons and the, uh, the center, the nucleus. And uh, it's very much like a rubber band. You can take a rubber band and you can stretch it. Well, it's the same with the oxygen-hydrogen bonds. And the more you heat water up, the weaker these bonds get till they're broken and it turns into steam. So starting with this that we found out that it was very important to define exactly what the water was. So we took our water and we had it analyzed at the University of um, Pennsylvania. Yeah, yeah. When we did that, we found out it's very different. And this was a paper that was written, a peer-reviewed paper, on polarized microwave and rate RF radiation effects on the structure and stability of liquid water. So we started looking at our water, and we found out, if I look at this, this normal curve right here is what typical water is. Our water was this water and this water here, these lower curves. What that represents is that the hydrogen and oxygen bond are weaker, that they're not as strong, that the hydrogen and oxygen can separate much more easy in the human body than normal. So that if this is typical water, your body has to take energy to break it apart to be able to use it. This Got it. Got it. Yeah. Here, it's free water to you. It, it doesn't take any energy to break that bond. Yeah. It breaks it very easily. So 
you actually don't have to spend your body's energy to break water down, which is something that you normally have to do. See, I don't think most people, and, I, and I'm, I'm most people, realize that we're breaking water down to use it inside, inside of our bodies. That's, a, that's not a concept that's discussed a whole lot. No, it isn't. For instance, in the mitochondria, in, in the nuclear cell of all the cells that are in your body, a typical cell has to have one million molecules of water per second go in and out of it. Mm. That's each and every cell. So each and every cell has to have one million molecules per second flowing through it, which is just an astronomical figure. I mean, it's hard to even conceive a million of these things every second going through every cell. Yeah. And when it does, it actually needs to use that hydrogen for one reaction and the oxygen for another reaction. It has to break those apart. It uses that and then it puts it back together again to carry away the, the uh, garbage out of your cell. Because every cell is doing uh, about a billion reactions per second in it. And it creates trash, just like when we eat and we go to a fast food joint place, let's say, we have paper, right, and wrappers and stuff like that. And you got to get rid of it. Your cells do exactly the same thing. They do the identical process. They use that hydrogen and oxygen and maybe some other minerals, and it takes carries them out. And that's how you get rid of the trash. And then that trash flows through the blood, goes to your liver and kidneys, and you either defecate or you urinate to get rid of the trash. Exactly. And it works. <laughs> But we don't really, you know, we don't really establish what goes on between the moment that we do this and the moment when we expel the liquids at the other end of it. The millions of processes that are going on cellularly and the necessity of having the proper water to be able to facilitate this efficiently. I mean, there's a whole lot of energetic processes that are going on in all of this that nobody talks about. It's uh, please keep going. This is this oh, is no one talks about it. You're you're exactly right, man. <laughs> we just take it for granted. But just think about that water. If that water is polluted, or it has um, extra uh, minerals that you you don't need, that sort of stuff. That's going to start harming your body's processes. Yes. And that million per second is not going to go through. Mm -hmm. And then that's when you start getting cancers. You start getting chronic diseases. That's when your liver fails, your kidney fails. Your liver is nothing but a filter. So are your kidneys. And they're supposed to filter. Uh, one of the ways the kidneys work is, you probably know, is water flows through it. The blood flows through it. It strips... It's supposed to strip the unnecessary chemicals out and it disassembles the water and all those chemicals. Then it takes the water and it ejects it back into the blood, hopefully, without all that extra stuff. And then it balances salts and that sort of stuff. And the rest here is supposed to urinate out. Mm -hmm. They're made of a lot of little filters, if you can see my hands. If you can think of tons and tons of these filters. And these get clogged. They can, you know, yes. they're supposed to be like that. Eventually, they go like this, and they can't filter anymore. And then and we have renal failure. Ultimately. Yeah. 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 Which some of us, you know, the statistics on this, if you look closely at health statistics now, um, most people are in some state of dehydration or near renal failure conditions especially as we go into the aging cycle and especially accelerated by the use of the pharmaceuticals that people are ingesting. These are all statistics that anybody could look up. Yeah, the, right now, um, technically about 40% of the United States is, has kidney problems. Yeah. 40%. 
four out of ten people. Another four of those people are going to get it. We're looking at eighty yeah. percent. Statistically, right now in the United States, fifty percent of men are going to get cancer. Yes, fifty percent of men will get cancer in their lifetime. Thirty-eight percent now of women will also get cancer. Yeah, and and I like to tell women that they're catching up on equality. They're catching up very quickly, yes. Yeah, because <laughs> by the year 2030, they'll have be a 50% too. So maybe that's not a good equality sign that they want. But if you can imagine, 50% of people get cancer. Will get cancer in your lifetime. That's just astounding. And the, all the recent news of all the musicians that we just lost to yeah. cancer. It's shocking. Probably, yeah. Um, they you know, the, Brent Fry, the Eagles, two related um, dysfunctions. Yeah, and and these were young men. I, I, Relatively I, speaking, I, yes, they yeah. were. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, the ideal age. <laughs> yeah, so what we found out is that people needed to be educated on water and exactly what water does and on top of it we also found out this water um, what I should do is probably talk about easy water for a second yeah let's go there that was the water by the way that um, I used when I was recovering from having my intestinal tract stripped from a massive doses of antibiotics back in 2013 our friend um, the late great Jeff Harvey helped me tremendously, um, giving me real high quality probiotics and using the easy water at the time to open up the cells so that the probiotics could begin to do their job. And I'm happy to say that to a great degree that helped a lot. So let's talk about the easy water. Yeah, we'll talk about the easy water. It's interesting, once we understood that this water was different, then some other scientists started looking at. Dr. Jerry Pollock, who wrote the fourth phase of water, easy water, at the University of Washington, looked at this water. And we decided that uh, it'd be nice if this water were easy water uh, as another explanation for it. Yes. And what we found out, let me talk about what easy water is, and we've been talking about the bodies and the, the cells. Easy. Easy water is a separation of ionic components away from a hydrophilic surface. And if I can speak about that, if this is a hydrophilic, hydro means water, philic means loving. Mm -hmm. All the cells in your body are hydrophilic cells. As opposed to hydrophobic. That's As opposed to hydrophobic. Oil is hydrophobic. Yeah, if you, that's why water and oil do not mix. But I can't say that if water and oil really do mix with the proper water, which is our water. Yes. So what happens is that a hydrophilic surface, which is the cell that's in your body, at 377th millionths of an inch. There's a separation of ionic charge, and you can see it here. There's a separation of charge, just like in your battery. You know, a battery has a positive and negative. Well, this water actually gets a positive and negative charge to it. And this is what we call out here bulk water, just the majority of water. Mm -hmm. When you drink that water in your body and ingest in your body, within a very short distance, as you can see here, it it changes its structure, its its um, electrical structure, and that's why it's called easy water or exclusion zone. Mm -hmm. Right here, it has excluded the positive charges, as you can see here, the protons. But what's interesting about this is that we used to believe that the chemical reactions that occurred in a cell 
were what drove the mitochondria, which gave your cells energy. It now looks like the water itself is what gives the cells energy. Not the chemical reaction when you eat food, but the chemical reaction when you drink water. And it looks like that's the reason why you can only live without water for two days, but you can live without food for 30 days. Right, right. Because what happens is that this becomes depleted, and when it's depleted, your cells don't function anymore. You don't have that. My gosh. The, just, let, me, let me just stop for a minute here and underscore this, because in our culture today, people rarely drink water in proportion to the food that they're taking in. We're told, for instance, what we're supposed to drink, eight, eight ounce glasses, that's 64 ounces of water per day. I'd say that's a bare minimum anyway. Most that's people today spend most of their time drinking coffee, drinking sodas, drinking anything except water. I, I, I literally work with somebody who I watch never drink water, and I'm like, how do you do that? I walk around with one of these mason jars with filtered, structured water in them. Um, but the, our, our culture, as we said earlier, is now dehydrated to the point where that's where we're beginning to see a lot of the breakdown. We can't even process our own food without this. This is critical, people. That, that's exactly right. And what's crazy about it is, let me go back to that picture again. Is that, um, we'll pick this yeah, up. Please, I didn't mean to disrupt you there. It's just that sometimes they need to be that, situated. Many, that's exactly, and, and what's even crazy about it, I'm glad you brought that up. Because this exclusion zone here, which is very critical to the function of the cell. Dr. Pollock found out that if you inject anesthesia into a nerve cell, mm. this collapses to zero, which means there's no energy for the cell to function. And that's why you lose pain when you are injected with anesthesia. It collapses this, so there's no electrical transport between the nerves and your nerves go dead. And that's how anesthesia works. Well, guess what? When you drink coffee or tea or something like this, or a Coke or sugar or something like that, that also collapses that zone. So the water is not as effective anymore. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you go through surgery, and I've done this now a couple of times where I've had, had to have surgery. I had orthopedic surgery done a couple of years ago. And when you come out of anesthesia, you're like, you could drink like, like boatloads of water. Yeah. You are so dehydrated. It's like a thirst that never ends. And that's why you're woozy, because you don't have enough water, proper water for the brain. We've seen that. We see that in sports. Anybody that does any kind of activity knows without hydration, you'll just pass out. That's correct. That, that's why the first things to go are your liver and your kidneys. It starts yeah. shutting them down, mm -hmm. hydrated, because it tries to keep the water for your heart and your brain, but, but it doesn't have all of it that it can use. Yeah. So now your brain is starting to get starved of oxygen. Remember I said water is hydrogen and oxygen. That's right. And it does break that down for usage in the body. When you don't have enough oxygen, it starts shutting things down. You, your kidneys, your liver fails. If you go without water for two days, you probably have, you might have permanent kidney damage. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that's why people go on dialysis, because they have to, they can't filter anymore. Their kidneys are damaged, they can't filter anymore mm -hmm. on it. So it's very, very important to have the right water. And people just think water's water. Water isn't water, you have to have the right water. So we found out this water is also easy water. So now we've found out two things about the water. It's easy water, and it's more easy water than even the water that's in your body. We also found out that it was lower energy bonded, 
And now we just found out that it's what we call deuterium depleted water, mm. which is very interesting. All water is made up of heavy water and light water. Light water being H2, two hydrogens, and an oxygen would ha is 16, which means it has eight electrons and eight protons and eight neutrons. That, that's the lightest form of oxygen. Hydrogen can also be heavy water, and everybody's heard about heavy water and nuclear reactions and that right, sort of right, thing. Yeah. And heavy water means that it has an extra neutron. A neutron has the same mass as a proton, and most of the weight, most of the mass in an atom is due to the protons and neutrons. The electrons don't weigh very much. They're essentially a non-item. But the protons and the neutrons, so when you add an extra neutron to a hydrogen, you get heavy heavy hydrogen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you have two of them, if I can show you a water molecule here, let me find it. I have a water molecule. We'll bring that up and we'll take a look at it. And you should be seeing a water molecule right now. You have a hydrogen, a hydrogen and an oxygen. That's why it's H2O. If you replace this one hydrogen with deuterium or you add an extra neutron, that's heavier water. Mm -hmm. If you replace this one or add another neutron to it, you got heavy water, which is called D2O. Now, what's the significance of heavy water versus light water? Well, first, the O16 molecule is very easily to be used in your body. It, your body likes O16. Mm -hmm. It also just likes hydrogen. It likes to be able to separate it. When you put deuterium in it, it's much harder for your body to use that deuterium. It can't use it as easily as it can with hydrogen. It likes the light molecule. Also with the oxygen, it can use the O16 very easily it can't use the O17 or the O18 very well. And when it does and it takes that neutron out, that neutron causes extra damage in your body. Oh, so it, you don't want these neutrons floating around in your body. Those are what cause damages, cancers, um, causes um, unwanted particles in it. It's a heavy, it's heavy. It's like if you go bowling and you were going bowling and you wanted to knock pins down, a nice heavy bowling ball <laughs> does yeah. that very well. Right? Yeah, it does. If I try knocking bowling balls or pins down with a balloon, it's not going to do not it. Gonna right? work. No, not going to work. Well, when this neutron gets in your body, it can careen around and knock everything out of out of whack. It can it can make extra electrons, which you don't want, the free radicals, and it can cause a lot of damage. So you want the lightest water in your body. We found out this is deuterium depleted. Most waters are 156 parts per million of heavy water in your in the water you drink. Our water turns out to be a roughly about 130 parts per million of deuterium, which means it's depleted. It, there's not as much deuterium in our water. And recent medical studies have shown that by reducing it by 20 to 30 parts per million, it is helping prevent cancers and it is help preventing uh, depression. And, and, and these are major universities and clinical studies. It was Mayo Clinic, uh, Boston uh, uh, Medical, um, it, it was all the major medical universities uh, combined together uh, to study this. So it is a, a breakthrough. Now most of that water is, is sold um, right now over in Europe out of some very clean uh, sources. Um, you can get that water at the North Pole or the South Pole. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not very 
many people have access to that. Yeah, right. uh, especially the south one. Yeah, places. Yeah, in Greenland. Yeah. Um, but here in the United States, it's very rare. So, is this water? Is this natural? Would we say the deuterium presence in water is normal? Is it accelerated? Um, based on what we know historically and anecdotally, have we had that presence of deuterium in the water, or is this a so-called modern occurrence in terms of... They are actually using it to study the ages, the geophysical ages. Right. They found out that it's a little bit more now than what it used to be uh, when man started roaming around the world. And they also found out that this deuterium, the normal water, occurs over land masses more than it does over right. the poles itself. Right. Um, just because it's colder there than it is, it's warmer. And because of the difference in the evaporation rates between the two, it tends to evaporate more at the, pole, um, at the equator, at the warm areas, than over land masses. That makes sense. Um, and some of the higher cancer rates that they've found are places with heavier water in it. Uh, and the places that have less heavy water, there's a place in Pakistan called Hunza, and you might have heard of Hunza water, but they studied that and found out those people were drinking about 130 parts per million, and they have the longest longevity average on the face of the earth for people. They're living to like 97, 98 years old average. I'm not surprised. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and they don't eat very well, but they have access to this water. So and what do you think the effect of something like, say, Fukushima over the long term is in terms of radiation? Not to mention the fact of all of the detonations that we've done, whether it was the nuclear, well, since World War II, just the ongoing detonations that have gone on in the atmosphere, underground, all the things that went on before that, and that radiation doesn't go away. And to that, the nuclear, I live outside this window here, a mile and a half down river is Three Mile Island. I was oh. here in 1970. Drink our water, drink our water, drink our water. <laughs> So, I mean, I, I, we're looking at something where we've had, a, we've had this, pardon the term, explosion of nuclear usage. So, I can't help but think that that's building the background radiation that we're also experiencing, which has got to be pushing these numbers way through the roof at this point. Well, it, it is, because the fallout, obviously, from, from all the, the nuclear testing, uh, there's something like 150 nuclear tests or more in the deserts of Nevada, uh, Area 51, they actually had to evacuate for a while because there were so many tests there, mm -hmm. uh, and blowing right across Area 51. Um, Fukushima, you know, all the accidents they've had. We were just approached by a gentleman, and I'm gonna speak to him after I speak with you this afternoon, about supplying water for all the people at Fukushima. Uh, just because it is deuterium depleted water and they have found out that they did a study in the study they took 50 mice and of the 50 mice they took 25 of them and put them on deuterium depleted water for a month they then took the 50 mice and irradiated all of them and they kept feeding the 25 the, the water and they found out after another, I think it was 30 days or 60 days, that all of the mice that had been irradiated had cancer. Hmm. All the mice that had been irradiated that were drinking the deuterium depleted water, none of them got cancer, which is amazing, absolutely amazing. And so, and there's been other studies that have shown that humans that have drank deuterium depleted water have a lower incidence of cancer. So this gentleman is looking at being able to supply uh, all Fukushima, the residents around there with water, which means I'm gonna to have to make 25,000 gallons per hour of this water, which will be an interesting task for us. Uh, right now we are, we're limited on our capabilities 
because these are all home built machines. I had never intended this to be a commercial product, to be perfectly honest. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, people started getting uh, returning to normal health. And as they did that, as they started normalizing, uh, more and more word got out and people would approach me. So we took on a few more people to help uh, or supply water to. And it's gotten to the point now where all the machines, I have four machines, are ran 24 hours, seven days a week. So we've approached a large manufacturer here in Idaho that is worldwide for manufacturing uh, processing equipment for potatoes and, and for the food industry. And they're building my first commercial version of it. And when that's built, then we're just going to start replicating those machines. So what is your capacity currently, Steve? Um, right now, uh, each machine can only make eight gallons or three gallons of water every eight and a half hours. So it's a very slow process. Mm -hmm. We expect that to be to accelerate it where we can make, um, I think it's a gallon every eight minutes. That's so, quite an improvement. Wow. Yeah, quite an improvement. It, it's going to change radically. Um, so we'll be able to supply mass markets at that point. We've also taken it to a few. We've made wine with this and beer with it mm -hmm. and um, taken them to a testing uh, contest where they've done excellent, uh, if not the not top. Bad. We're I taking it, it to, quite well. Yeah. Here's going to go to a water tasting contest they have uh, in, where's that at? It's in Berkeley Springs, West Virginia. Um, it's actually the first spa town in the United States. I've and uh, for to bolster yeah. their, their tourism there, they just started doing a uh, water tasting contest about 25 years ago, I think. And so um, they have different categories, and so we've entered into the purified water category. Um, so I think we'll perform pretty well there, to be honest. Because um, with what it does and how clean it is, it doesn't taste flat. It's actually really smooth tasting water. Uh, a lot of people mention that it's sweet. Um, and it's so I, it's I think water, it, it's, it's heavier on the tongue when you taste it. That's been my experience. Now, yeah. About yeah. Your, your current water, the easy water definitely had a density to it. that was vastly different. I, I would say when I, the first time I tasted the easy water, <clears throat> it felt like drinking real water for the first time. Mm -hmm. That's funny. A lot of people say that. It uh, has, <laughs> yeah. It was like you, it touched you and you, you drank it and you went, whoa, wait a minute. That's different. It, it is very much like tasting a fine Bordeaux or something like that, a, a, a good malt ale or anything that has craft to it. It's a, you would call it a craft water on any level, if not for the therapeutic and scientific purposes, certainly from the aesthetic side of it. Can you hear us again? Yeah, yeah we had a little bit of a blip out there on the internet. Yeah, <laughs> We're back. yeah it's, it's very good water, um, and it actually has legs, so it has a different viscosity, I think, than other mm -hmm. kinds of water. That's a good um, if you can... Yeah, I kept saying it felt heavier on the tongue. It does. Yeah, it, has a, it definitely yeah. has a different viscosity, viscosity uh, to it. It even has legs, kind of like wine does when mm -hmm. you tilt it back. Very much. Yeah. Um, but we and we often say this is water that's harkened to water in the past, the, what water used to be thousands mm -hmm. and thousands of years ago before yeah. man came along and polluted it and um, you know radiated it and, and things like that. Um, and it seems so. Go ahead. Answer modern phenomenon i think um mm. you really don't I, I love history channel and you always find cavemen and and neanderthals um dying because of a cavity an abscess tooth or um a broken leg but you never hear about mm -hmm. people dying of cancer <laughs> or brain or tumors yeah, yeah. in ancient times and i really think it's um, a modern development and so i really think that has a lot to do with the water we drink 
Uh, the World um, Health Organization came out and attributed 90% of our diseases to um, polluted waters and dehydration. And I think people are dehydrated because they're not drinking the white, right water that's entering their cells as it should. Um, it's buffered by pollutants and con contaminants, um, minerals, electrolytes, yada, yada, yada. I can go on and on. Um, but I like to say we're the anti-bottle water company. Um, even though we do bottle water, um, it's different than anything else that you can find on the market for that reason, that we um, carry no contaminants, that there are no pollutants, um, that we don't have electrolytes and um, minerals behind it. Um, it does come from a natural source, and um, this water can be purified anywhere in the world with our technology, um, which is excellent, which means that we can take this anywhere in the world, help people anywhere around the world with this technology and purify water from any source. Now, um, are you just taking the water from whatever the source is? Are you doing any filtering before you bring it into the system? Mm -hmm. um, so we we pull it from an ancient aquifer here in Idaho. Um, okay. It goes through a rigorous 13-stage filtration process. Um, it's distilled, and then it's finally put through our, our process. Um, the distillation is put in place that really help um, uh, carry off more contaminants and pollutants because ours is just so um, it's so minute in its purification. Mm -hmm. And so um, we would still get a lot of... Um, uh, contaminants, mm -hmm. pollutants, et cetera, um, in our, our process, and it was actually starting to break down our process. So in order to help make it more efficient, um, we had to put in another step in place. So you can rest assured that when you're drinking this water, that it's- makes a lot of sense, water yes. Water you can drink. Yeah, yeah, there's no hormones in it left mm -hmm. over, endocrines that can you know cause breast cancers in women, uh, cancers in men and men. You know, the, the rate of breast cancer in men is starting to rise rapidly. Um, I've had people no, laugh at me when I tell them that, but it's true. Men do get breast cancer, and, yeah. and water has been known as a source for that just because of um, birth control pills, um, estrogen being introduced into the water yes. source. They've introduced studies that show that, that the antidepressants and, and these uh, uh, the other uh, Drugs that we're using to treat all these alleged emotional problems, you know, we are in the water and now filtering back out into the drinking water, the place where we're being drugged to the point of source of public water now. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we're but, swimming, we're kind of swimming again in our own. <clears throat> yeah. I don't yeah. want to be rude about this, but you know what I mean. Yeah. You know, well, that's why cities collapsed in the past. Mm -hmm. is because they didn't have access to good, clean water mm -hmm. for drinking water, and they just kind of um, died in their own sewage. You know, that's why they... So we're the main removing the grossest, most appearing stuff today, but in effect, we're not really removing some of the things that are the most lethal to us. And, and the quality well, of our water going through these perpetual systems of recirculating water, bringing it back in a pipe system. I can't help but think that, you know, we were meant to live closer to the actual natural source of water. Um, totally agree with you. Yes, totally agree with you. And, and the problem is, is that uh, most of the cities now live near the ocean or the majority of the people in very dense cities. Yeah. And of course they're dumping all their trash out in the oceans. Mm -hmm. um, and they rely upon recirculating a lot of their water. Exactly. One of the major terms right now is toilet to tap. Yes. A lot of cities, <laughs> because the, the what we're doing. Yeah. Yeah, have to recirculate the toilet water, the tap water. Yeah, I, lived, um, I lived in LA, I went to school in Los Angeles. Yes. Um, in the mid, early to mid 2000s, and even then they were doing it, and our campus actually smelled a little bit because um, they're yeah. actually water onto the lawns and things like that. So I know that's something that Los Angeles has been doing for past 12 yeah, years probably or so. Yeah. Um, and they're touting it as if it's a good thing, which to some extent I guess it is um, as far as recycling water goes. But um, health-wise, I think it's a terrible well, I don't think we want to drink yeah. gray water. I mean, that's essentially what it is. It's run through some purification. It's pretty much gray water. Yeah. Right. 
Let's talk a little bit about the process itself, if, if you would. I, I think this would be a good point to kind of maybe bring that in, in terms of what you want to show us. <coughs> the, the water itself is in a residence chamber. It, it hits residents just like uh, our friend Tesla was trying to bring down bridges and buildings with mm -hmm. residents. We actually hit the resonance structure of the OH bond of hydrogen and oxygen so that it actually resonates the bond. And at that resonance, what happens is it is capable of changing the bond. And I do have a video here that's talk about I can show a video so Randy talking about what this does the the process that we have I have a little illustration here that might help show us exactly what I'm talking about <clears throat> this video that I'm I've put up is a typical oxygen atom and as you can see there are eight electrons if we count them one two three four five six seven eight and these two locations are holes that's there's no electrons there so an electron can jump in if they wanted to and in the center here we have eight electrons or eight protons and eight neutrons <laughs> and as in the typical um, orbiting um, fashion that, that we believe the molecules behave now. You can see the center rotates along with each one of the electrons rotate around it. And this is what they refer to as the electron cloud. And in fact, if you heard of the internet cloud, this is how they came kind of came out with it. They were referring about this and about data being everywhere. Well, the electron circles around all the electrons. So this is how a typical oxygen atom operates. And to form water, it will actually pick up two hydrogens, and those hydrogens, I'll stop it here right now, if you notice where there were no electrons in the oxygen, there are now electrons from the hydrogen are now occupying it. So they have bonded, they have shared together. But they're sharing that electron. Mm -hmm. This electron and this electron are shared with the oxygen. So what happens is that as the electrons are going around, you can see that the electrons from the hydrogen are actually being used by the oxygen right now. And then a little bit later, what happens is that those electrons then go around the hydrogen. So they're shared with the hydrogen. So these two things are sharing the electrons back and forth. That's what a bond is, you share. Mm -hmm. So that they're sharing. So the other thing that's important to look at <clears throat> are what we call spins of electrons. If you look at this particular electron right here, you'll see that it's spinning downwards. If you look at this electron, you'll see it's spinning upwards. Mm -hmm. And that's so for the conservation of energy law, so that they spin in opposite directions, so it's the least amount of energy being used by that atom. Same with the hydrogens here. One spin is up and one spin is down, and they're going counterclockwise here. It, it kind of looks like a Mickey Mouse face here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very much. <laughs> Your hydrogen and his face is the oxygen there. And these little electrons that are going around the center here are spinning in opposite directions. Mm -hmm. So now we'll let it spin one more time. And we'll notice that they are still spinning in the opposite direction. And then all of a sudden, this that you now see represents the electromagnetic field that I'm applying to the water in a resonance cavity. Mm -hmm. And what happens is if this arrow here, these arrows here, 
represent the direction of the electron field or the electric field. These up arrows here represent the magnetic field. And the electric field and the magnetic field are always at right angles to each other. <clears throat> but you can see it's a very uniform field. It's not random and it only goes in one direction. And so then what that does is that influences the electrons in the hydrogen. And you can see that these electrons that are now spinning the same way and that they're going in the same direction. See, they're, they're both going in a clockwise direction now. Before, one went in a clockwise, and the other went in a counterclockwise. And both of these guys now, the electrons right there, are spinning in the same direction. Well, what does that mean? And that's very significant. All matter wants to be in the lowest energy possible state. Okay, everything decays to the lowest energy. When you put something in a higher energy, it wants to get back down to a lower energy. It wants to be able to do a chemical reaction very easily. Well, with me having changed that, as you just saw, what happens is that the hydrogens say, okay, Let's find some place else where we can get rid of our energy. So let's separate from the oxygen and do a chemical reaction. And we want to do that pretty badly. Same with the oxygen. When we tested this on cement and we took it to Kirsten's University out in uh, Los Angeles, we found out that it cured cement in four days instead of 28 days. It was seven times faster. Wow. And on top of that, it cured to almost double the strength or 100% greater. It, it went from 4 KSI cement to 6 KSI cement. That's PSI, 1,000 That's PSI. PSI. I, I'm <laughs> familiar with it. Yeah, so very much. Yeah. It went to working strength within four days. That means if you build a building, within four days after you poured the concrete, you could be in there drilling holes in it, putting it together, doing whatever you wanted to, and it would only have to be 50% of the cement. <clears throat> That's what this water does. It makes all chemical reactions much faster. When we did beer with it and we did wine with it, we found out that some of the beer would go to 14 to 20% strength. We oh. found <laughs> wine went to 28% strength. Wow. Oh, it was just terrific. <laughs> yes. Yeah, boy, that's that's great. That's, that's really yeah. phenomenal. We were talking about just in the concrete, um, the amount of efficiency that's gained. It's stronger. It sets faster. Yeah, it, it's just amazing. Uh, we just recently here, because of some of the work we're refabricating an office here because we're expanding. Mm -hmm. and. Our people next door uh, are rock people and cement people, and we took some of their cement that was supposed to be half an hour drying, and we mixed some of our water with it, and it dried in five minutes. It, it, it was pretty phenomenal. Um, it's kind of fun playing around with this water. It's also fantastic on what it has done for some people's health. Um, I can give you an example here and bring up another picture, if you don't mind. No, please go ahead. It has done to help someone. Um, we can find here. No, I'm not finding it here for a second, Randy. We'll have to cut this again here. At the That's okay. Go that's here. why we're pre recording. <laughs> yeah, that's. Sometimes we don't have that luxury. So then, you know, we go live and, you know, you just throw whatever you got against the wall. And sometimes we have moments like this on the air. And sometimes, <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. 
that's when I should really wish I was a stand-up comedian, but that's not my gift. <laughs> yeah. Um, Song and dance routine. Yeah, or something. Actually, this is where you, if you're smart, you have something you drop in. You go, we're going to go to a break now. For a break, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But uh, doing it this way affords us to be able to do the video editing later. Yeah. Yep. I don't even know have a clock on this. This is interesting. We don't even have a clock on this recorder. I'm guessing we're kind of close to, where are we? Uh, it's two to nine now, so... I think we have about 10 minutes-ish window. Okay. Okay. okay so. so throw whatever you have at it at this, you know, in the next 10 to 15. I'm not going to hold you to it strictly. I want you to have the luxury of going where you want to go with the video. So. Okay. So as I was saying, <clears throat> One of the things that we found out that it was helping some people normalize their health. And of course, I'm not a doctor and none of these statements are FDA approved. Good. We're just talking about anecdotal. Exactly. Some people have reported to me. <clears throat> this particular gentleman was 77 years old at the time. And as he... Um, spoke to us, he told us that he couldn't walk more than 50 feet and that he was going to the Mayo Clinic and they wanted to replace his kidneys, give him a kidney transplant. Hmm. And he said, do you think the water would help? I said, I don't know. Try drinking the water and let's see what happens. So he drank the water and started reporting to us his blood results. What he reported to us was the creatinine and the GFR, GFR is glomerular filtration rate. <clears throat> and these are normal numbers that you'll see on your blood test when you go in so they can test whether your kidneys are working or not. Mm -hmm. Creatinine is supposed to be greater than 60 if it's normal. And the creatine is supposed to be lower than 1.5. So, when he started drinking the water, he reported to us he was at 3.37, which is on the very verge of, you. well, he should have had dialysis. And on top of that, at four to five, they want to start replacing your kidneys to get that down. And he said, Steve, I'm not quite ready to stop what I've been doing. I've led an active life. And he said, I would like to keep continuing on. He said, I, I know I won't ever be able to walk very far again without a, a cane, but he said, I don't want this to cramp my lifestyle where I'm on dialysis three to five times a week. I can't go anywhere. I can't travel anymore. You know, I'm just kind of locked into my house. So he started drinking it, and right here at 3.37, within one month, he was down to 2.7. And the Mayo Clinic had no explanation for it. They just said maybe things reversed. Another month he was down at 2.27. At that point they said, we need to revisit whether you're going to the kidney failure or not. We, there's something going on and it seems to be doing okay. And we, we'll, we'll just watch you. Well, his GFR started jumping up too. And then at 1.199, when it gone from 3.37 to 1.99, they said, we can't really handle you anymore because you're not really technically in kidney failure anymore. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. your insurance isn't going to cover you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because you're not in kidney failure. Um, you, you have weak kidneys. Well, by the time he was done through this, and this is through 2011, he's now um, 2016, so he's now 85, 86 years old. He has the kidneys right now of about a 15-year-old. His wow. GFR is above, yeah, above 60. He's yeah. traveled a lot. He's teaching at a university again. And I know a few years ago when I spoke with him, he was running about five miles a week. Hmm. He, he no longer needed a cane, and he was out running 
and he doesn't need a kidney transplant, unfortunately, the the insurance would no longer cover him because he was technically not in, in his kidney. Yeah. So they won't pay for any kidney work. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, his kidneys go bad again. Well, he's 85 years old now, so... Um, <clears throat> It's pretty good. Maybe 95, pretty good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. But his liver and kidneys are perfectly healthy now. That if he ever does quit working, and he will at some point, I don't know what it'll be, but it won't be from his kidneys or his that liver. That is a good life, by the way. That's a good life when oh. you can do what you love, and that's quality of life. That's, but that's quality of life. You know yeah. the. Unfortunately, there's a saying going around for a lot of the prescription salesmen that say five by 50. They'd like to have you on five prescriptions by your 50 years old. Yep. And right now, the United States, unfortunately, ranks about 23rd in quality of life for people over 50 years old um, because of the diseases, the chronic diseases that are entering into. You know, we, we, we all retired uh, or would like to retire at some age and we'd like to know that we can travel and we can do things we don't want to be hooked up to machines or taking pills that, that knock us out or, or that sort of stuff we'd like to have a quality of life yeah and fortunately this water has been able to help people have a quality of life where they could travel again where they weren't dependent upon things or they weren't in the hospital. They weren't tied to tubes. Uh, so we've been very, very lucky that way. Uh, that's one of the reasons why Jeff was uh, so high on this water, promoting yeah. this water. Mm -hmm. it, it helped people, and, and Jeff was always about helping people. Yes, he was. Yeah. So he, he was a tremendous man, and we miss him deeply. Mm. Yeah. I think. I can tell you that for sure. Um, so going forward, you know, you're obviously increasing facilities. You are now going to do commercial versions of the machines. Um, and you are done doing a funding campaign. So let's talk a little bit about that and what you want to let people know about how they can partake of what you're doing. And hopefully we can get this technology pushed out because this is important. We're in a critical time in history right now. I mean, on so many fronts, on, on the energy front, on the political front, uh, in terms of health, all of the things that are coming to the forefront right now, we are looking at either a breakthrough or a breakdown. And I would like to hope that we're going to go for the breakthrough. So tell us about what you're up to. Yeah, this, we're strongly pushing to make a, a breakthrough on this water so we can deliver it to people in masses. Yes. Uh, we just think all the water that's being drank right now is bad water, uh, unfortunately. Uh, it's got so much stuff in it, so, much, so many pollutants. And even if you drink it out of bottled water, most bottled waters are plastic. It, the water will leach the plastics out of it. Uh, you know, BPA was a big concern before, it still is. If you drink any water out of a plastic bottle, chances are that bottle has reached over 60 degrees, um, uh, which is... Certainly so, riding around in the back of tractor trailer trucks and being shipped and settled in cargo bays, not to mention the sanitation issues that are involved with bottling in the first place, which we know is, is a vector as well for disease. Yeah, and, and you know, you toss it in the back of your car and your car gets uh, 120, 130, 140 degrees. That starts breaking the plastics down and you're drinking plastic. So we make sure all of our water uh, is in bottle. Uh, and we've been able to store our water for years and years in a, in a glass jar with no bacteria growth whatsoever. Our water is 0, 0.00 parts per million. Hmm. Water that you drink was always meant to cleanse the body. It That's was right. never meant to deliver minerals into your body. You eat food and have the normal digestive processes break down. 
I, I have written a book on this, and um, if I can just share that with you for a second. Yes. If people would are interested in it, they can go to Amazon, and they, as you can see, it's the digestive process and the role of water in digestive health. Digestion explained and how water affects digestion and health. And there's a few national doctors that we're now talking to that uh, might possibly start getting involved with us on promoting this water also. And they're major, major physicians. Um, <clears throat> when, when they do, uh, hopefully they'll also start explaining to people how important water is. For instance, one of the things with water is you want it unbuffered. You want it to be able to change the pH. So when you drink water and it goes into your stomach, if your stomach's acidic, you want it to change the water to acidic. When it travels into the next part of your body, you want it less acidic. Mm -hmm. You don't want it alkaline. You don't want it to be... We're getting a freeze up here. Trying to bring this, we were commercializing the first version of it. We went through a funding campaign where we were supposed to receive uh, our first income or our first batch to do this, because this has been self-funded until this time. And the gentleman that did it only completed half of it. Mm -hmm. uh, was the dentist, he got in to uh, purchase a dental practice out in California. So he didn't have the rest of the money to invest with us because he was buying another practice. And so that's left us a little short on what we want to raise. Mm -hmm. So we're out there talking to other people right now about maybe fulfilling the rest of that transaction. Um, I also, after this interview, will be talking to, with the gentleman from Japan that wants to supply a, a large amount of water, and he might come up with that funding too. We're speaking of that. But it, it's kind of funny that our water will be used first on a mass scale to help people in another country again. Just like my flat screen television went overseas, and they're the people who adapted it, and they came back in the United States. Well, I've been told. And I've had an inside view of what is basically a functional cold fusion system that that technology will not be deployed inside of America first. Um, sadly, the technology, the funding, the, the infrastructure for manufacturing, all of this has served to remove us from being a priority market at this present time. So. Yeah, I, we're, we're a third world country when it comes are, to that. We are very much so right now, yes. I know of another gentleman that's over in India now that's working not on cold fusion but on another zero energy project mm -hmm. that has been up and running and it's been accepted by their nuclear industry over there. In fact, the guy used to be head of the nuclear industry. His yes. name is Wari. And he has a device, and this gentleman from here is going over to measure the final outputs on it because I explained some things to him about how they should measure this. Mm -hmm. And they're over measuring it right now. And he'll have the report, and it would not be adopted here in the United States first. Um, we'll still be tied to the oil companies and the electric companies. Well, a lot of other people in the world will be getting healthy water and free energy. It's kind well, of sad. I don't think, you know, the purpose of what we do on this show and what you're doing here as well is we're, communi we're putting this message out. It's up to the people that have become proactive about promoting it, about using better products, investing in the products, supporting people who are doing this. And again, I want to redirect you. We had a slight internet glitch, so I don't know how much we lost there. But talk a little bit about the, the, the campaign that you're doing to bring funding in. 
in terms yeah, of is it a GoFundMe campaign? Is that mm -hmm. okay? Let's talk well, about that. Well, we're going to be doing a crowdsourcing, um, okay. and so approximately twenty thousand dollars is what we're trying to raise, um, and in doing so, um, growing awareness of our water, but um, also just raising money so that we can um, fund clinical studies to be done in China. Mm -hmm. um, there's a few foundations that have come under fire for um, experimenting their products on people and um, unfortunately hurting people um, as a result of their experimentation of these particular um, pharmaceuticals, for instance. Um, you know, the Gates, I think the Gates Foundation is one of those. Um, and so uh, certain countries have actually banned clinical trials being done on their citizens there because too many people have gotten hurt. Um, and so uh, one country that we have talked to a few doctors in um, is China and they are willing to help us find people in China that might benefit from this water because um, it's just another venue for us to be able to help more people. Yes. Um, and so this will be another way to do that. Yeah, Randy, you brought that, that, that was a good point. If somebody, one of the companies would spend as much on us as they spend on a 30 second for the Super Bowl, yeah. Yeah. we could help yeah. Hundreds of thousands of people. Yeah, sadly, the, the Super Bowl tonight's going to be, and we are filming this on Sunday. The viewers out there are seeing this obviously later, pre record. But you're going to see the, the traditional snack foods, sodas, yeah. all of the products that I'm sorry to say, as much as I might occasionally like a Tostito or something, um, <laughs> these are not contributing to our health. We live no. in a junk food culture and a culture that is consuming things that are killing us. The toxic loads that we're handling in our bodies are unsustainable in the long run. And that includes young people because yeah. we've accelerated all of this. So you, you're going to go to China because China is receptive. The food and drug administration, you can't say this, but I can the food and drug administration, because we've talked with Dr. David Lewis, who has told us about the skewing of statistics that the Food and Drug Administration is actively promoting the pharmaceutical company agendas. So they're not going to test it here in the mainstream United States, but the people in China who have a culture of holistic and natural health, I would think would be a very receptive market. And in that, That's exactly what they told us, Randy. That's exactly. They said, well, they'll accept it over there as something pure mm -hmm. that will help people. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and they have a little bit of resentment against the United States pharmaceutical companies over there right now. Well, I, I think that the rejection of Western culture is, is hitting a critical mass over there because they've seen what has happened. But we can take the good things about Western culture and keep that. There are positive things. People like you who encompass the best of what I consider to be American ingenuity and enterprise. And these are the things that you, the listeners, have to support if we're gonna go forward here because our major corporations are not gonna do this. And this technology that we've talked about throughout this interview is a keystone towards restoring people back to balance and health and quality of life as well. Um, is there a place where people can go for uh, the crowdsource funding? Yes, and um, actually, if I can furnish that to you, for you to um, put, that up. put that up. Yes, um, that great. would be excellent, um, and that way they can actually. Well, they can go to our website. We and, have and our website as well. They can actually. One more we time have, with the website, please. Yes, <laughs> yes, the DaviniaWater.com, and they Got can it. go there. And we have fields where they can fill out information if they want to email me directly, um, and we can give them information on investor relations. Um, uh, funding for our clinical trials in, in China and then any other questions that they might have. There we go. Okay. Bring that oil bottle up one more time here at the end and let's take a look. Take a look Here's at our it. oil bottle and as you can see it hasn't changed. I think so. It, it really does taste wonderful. I can so imagine. Oil and, water. and here's the other. Still sludge at the bottom on that one but on yeah. our other bottle. Yeah. Fully mixed oil and water do mix. Amazing stuff, folks. Okay, I, excellent. Anything else you want to be heard saying as we go out tonight? 
we want to thank you so much for hosting this and for what you do, Randy. If, yeah. if it weren't for people like you, the news wouldn't get out. Uh, mainstream media will not carry it. No, they won't. But, you um, know, someone who knows what's going on, mm -hmm. who, who knows the facts and is not part of the sheep herd. <laughs> Um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, for me, we really want to thank you. This has been a marvelous learning experience. I mean, when I sit down with somebody like you, as the listeners will as well, it opens up new ways to think about things. And that's what we're trying to do. So I want to thank my guests for this program, um, for coming on and discussing a much needed subject. Um, in the future, we're going to have you back as you get developments. You're welcome to come back and shout out to us anytime, Steve and Kirsten. And uh, good luck in the coming months with, with what you're doing. Keep us posted. This is All Planet TV. I'm Randy Moggins. We'll be back with another show very soon. The truth is out there. It's inside you. Now, go find it.